Hey there. For your next lesson, I'm going to ask you to make some comparisons between China and Europe circa the first half of the 15th century or so. Um, and so I wanted to spend a little time today just catching you up on uh, the Ming Dynasty, which is where China is at in the period that we'll be talking about in our next class. And in order to do that, as is the case with all history and especially Chinese history, I got to talk a little bit about what comes before it, and that is the Mongols. I have made probably 25 passing references to the Mongols, and you might or might not be familiar with the broad outlines of that history. Um, so I'm going to try and spell that out in extremely limited detail because we're going to spend a week on it pretty soon. Um, and the first thing that you need to know is that the Mongols, unlike basically every other um, successful sort of uh, empire builders in history are pastoral, at least in more recent history, are pastoral nomadic people, meaning that um, they primarily traditionally make their living by herding animals and moving around to follow where the pasture is available, as opposed to settling down, um, build establishing farms and relying on settled agriculture. Um, so they live a more rural lifestyle, they live a more mobile lifestyle, um, in many cases, um, gender relations are going to be much more egalitarian. Women are going to have more freedom and more responsibilities outside of the household um, in Mongol and other pastoral nomadic societies compared to settled agricultural societies, uh, compared to the people, most of the people that the Mongols are conquering. Um, the Mongols established the biggest land empire ever in world history at its maximum extent in 1294. It covers all the area that you see shaded in. They achieve a bunch of those initial conquests under Genghis Khan, who's the founder of the Mongol Empire. After Genghis Khan's death, um, the Mongol Empire will fragment into four major khanates, um, which is to say sort of principalities or kingdoms, um, led by various descendants of his. Um, and that's why you see that shaded in four different colors on this map here. Um, but the Mongols are, but if if you think that history is just a race to you know conquer more territory and color in territory on a map, um, the Mongols win history. Uh, this is the biggest chunk of land ever under, uh, contiguous chunk of land ever under the rule um, of one group of people. Um, we're going to focus uh, on the Yuan Dynasty, which is what Mongol rule is called in China. They conquer a bunch of northern China in Genghis Khan's lifetime, but in 1279, under the leadership of his grandson Kublai, um, the Mongols conquer, uh, knock over the Song Dynasty in China and establish themselves as a dynasty. So you can already get a sense of the kind of continuity that the Mongols are trying to establish with Chinese history by taking a Chinese dynastic name and adopting a lot of the patterns of Chinese administration retaining some amount uh, of existing administrative structures that have been used in the Song in earlier periods. Um, however, the Mongols also do a bunch to upset the Chinese uh, and to break away from previous Chinese patterns of life, um, in particular Confucian scholars who had been the elite of the, of the Song dynasty based on their performance in the civil service exams. Confucian scholars are going to be kind of pushed to the side. Um, the Mongol rulers will bring in a lot of other foreign experts from various other parts of their empire. Um, they'll rely on Taoists for spiritual advice. They'll bring some Buddhists in. They'll bring some uh, Muslim advisors in, some Persian administrators. Um, and so many traditional Confucian scholars will be very, very aggrieved to see what they perceive as these foreign barbarians coming in and taking, usurping their rightful place as the real governors of China. Um, the Yuan Dynasty we'll talk uh, a little bit more about when we get to the Mongols, but that's kind of the basic pattern that you need to know in order to set the stage for the Ming. Um, Kublai Khan, who's the founder of the Yuan Dynasty, dies in 1294. And after that, his successors have problems keeping the empire together, uh, the Chinese side of it at any rate. Um, and so over the course of the next few decades, Mongol rulers are going to lose influence gradually. Um, one reason for that is that actually other Mongols elsewhere in the empire believe that the Mongols have become too Chinese, which is kind of ironic because the Chinese think that the Mongols aren't nearly Chinese enough. They always resent them as foreign rulers. Um, but there are other Mongols that believe that Kublai Khan and his successors in China have gotten too urbanized, too comfortable, they don't know how to hunt or ride horses anymore, um, and that they've essentially gotten soft. So there's some tensions within that broad empire. Um, within the Chinese uh, half, or the Chinese segment rather, of the Mongol Empire, there's also lots of kind of your classic uh, monarchy problems, which is people fight with each other, they try and um, take their, their brother's or their cousin's share of the inheritance. There's lots of rivalries. And the Mongols don't um, excel in administration in the way that the Song emperors had for such a long time. Um, and so they have a harder time holding the empire together. 
one consequence of that is that there are some there's deterioration in irrigation systems. They let a lot of those canals that you know about fall into disrepair. Um, there's weaker authority in the countryside. Peasants rebel against a combination of what they perceive as poor administration and excessive taxation. Um, and then there's a series of natural disasters like floods and droughts and famines and also the plague, um, all of which in the conception of the mandate of heaven, which was one of the first things I ever told you about China, all of which start to support the belief that the Yun dynasty, the, the Mongol rulers, have lost the favor of heaven and no longer deserve to be in power. So in the mid 14th century, you start to see all of these rebellions against the Mongols for a variety of reasons, led by a variety of interesting characters. And one of them pictured here, whose name is Zhu Yanzhong, um, will finally, he'll, ca he'll raise an army, he'll capture some territory. Uh, and in 1368, he will take the city of Beijing, uh, overthrow the Mongols definitively and found a new dynasty known as the Ming. And that's what we'll be comparing um, to 14th century Europe in your next class. Couple things about the Ming dynasty. Um, number one, uh, they have, I think it was probably too flippant to say a policy of making China great again, but it's definitely a policy of making China Chinese again. And so there's a very intentional reaction, especially in the early Ming years, um, of throwing out a lot of the Mongol policies and bringing back a lot of the policies that had been attributed to the greatness of the Song dynasty when it was regarded as China's golden age. In particular, Confucian scholars are going to in, are going to experience a huge upswing in their fortunes uh, and attempt to bring them back to the position that they had lost when the Mongols came in and booted them out of their positions of powers. In particular, um, the civil service examination system is going to come back with a vengeance um, and get bigger and more terrifying than ever. What you're looking at on the right side of your screen is the examination cells where candidates for these exams would have to sit. There's walls between them to deter cheating. They started using ID numbers instead of names in order to prevent um, bias or bribery from influencing the marking, the scoring, the grading of the examinations. Um, pass rates are something like one or two percent for the hardest form of the exam. The longest one to get the highest position lasts up to 72 hours. So these things are really serious. The Ming basically reinvent the SAT as you know it, um, and you have them to thank for standardized testing. So that's cool. Um, there is a, a considerable population growth in the Ming Dynasty because they, they spend a bunch of energy and money reinvesting and building some of that farming infrastructure um, that the Mongols had neglected and allowed to deteriorate. So you start to see more irrigation networks, you start to see some of the canals rebuilt, you start to see roads, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a little bit of a shift away from growing crops for export and a shift back towards growing crops for consumption, which will help explain part of that population boom. It is important to note the Mongol empire is very, very friendly to trade. It actually, um, when when much of uh, Asia is united under, under Mongol rule, there is just a massive increase in long distance trade because they've created political stability and they implement a bunch of policies that are designed to incentivize trade. And China doesn't go backward on that. At one point, an early Ming emperor actually tries to abolish the use of paper money, and it creates this massive economic crisis. And it turns out that he can't do it. That was a Mongol innovation or a Mongol policy, rather, that he um, has to, it turns out that he has to uh, maintain. Um, so China doesn't go back to being... Um, a completely rural agricultural society, because as you learned when we talked about the Song Dynasty, it wasn't to begin with, even before the Mongols showed up. But there is an attempt to be more culturally and socially reminiscent of the Song Dynasty. Um, the state also invests a lot in literary production and in artistic production. There's an old trope in American sitcoms from the second half of the 20th century that for some reason really persists in TV, uh, which is that somebody bursts into a room and knocks something over and some woman screams, oh no, my priceless Ming vase. That's a reference to the massive growth in the export of this really distinctive blue and white um, ceramics from China in this period. Um, and a lot of that stuff is manufactured at a ceramics factory that's established by the that is, that's established by the government. So here's another example of commitment to both art and to developing some goods for export, um, because it's very clear that you can't go back on commercialization in this stage. Um, so the state really tries to build its legitimacy by supporting um, these sort of artistic uh, values that are generally held to be the proper attributes of a gentleman or a well-cultivated person in the Confucian tradition. Um, 
One other thing about the Ming Dynasty that generates endless fascination in my classes, mostly from me, um, is the increasing power of a group of people known as eunuchs. Eunuch is a term for a man who's been castrated, um, and in the Chinese context, in the Ming Dynasty context, eunuchs primarily serve, or they, they originate uh, in the emperor's household, um, and part of the rationale behind castration as a condition of their job um, is that they can be um, trusted to be around the emperor's family, and particularly around women in the emperor's family, without concern um, that there will be any extramarital sexual relations happening, or that they will father a child and try and um, build their own political dynasty. Um, the eunuchs uh, eventually grow to be major, not just sort of household servants, but to be really, really major political players in China, um, because they have, as members of the, of the emperor's household, they have constant access, they have the emperor's ear in a way that government officials cannot. And there's this constant rivalry in the Ming period between the eunuchs and the Confucian civil servants, um, because the, the, those are two different you know, social classes, they get there in two different ways. And because the eunuchs are personally loyal to the emperor, whereas at least in principle, the scholars, the bureaucrats um, are loyal to the state, not to any particular individual who holds the title of emperor. And so look out for that to have an impact in the Ming dynasty as well, that constant struggle for power between the Confucian scholars and the eunuchs. Um, finally, one person that we really need to talk about, not quite on an Ibn Battuta level, but still kind of a big deal is a guy named Zheng He. Um, Zheng He is a, um, so is a, uh, comes to prominence during the reign of somebody known as the Yongle Emperor. I know that you're tempted to pronounce that as Yongle, but please don't do it. It offends my sensibilities based on being really bad at speaking Chinese. Um, the Yongle Emperor is an emperor in the Ming Dynasty um, who's unusually sort of forward looking and scientifically minded for his period. And he actively encourages trade, maritime exploration, and the compilation of this massive encyclopedia that reaches something like 11. 1,000 volumes. Um, under the Yongle Emperor, Zheng He becomes an admiral in the Chinese Navy. Um, China constructs this massive fleet. In that bottom picture, you can see a scale model of one of Zheng He's treasure ships up against a scale model of one of uh, Christopher, one of the, the ships in which Christopher Columbus makes his first transatlantic voyage, uh, if you want to get a sense of how big these themes were. Um, and Zheng He leads this massive treasure fleet um, in a series of seven voyages around the entire Indian Ocean basin. And so he's one of the most accomplished navigators and uh, mariners of his time. In the course of these voyages, uh, he's got a couple of jobs. One of them is just to collect information um, and to collect sort of specimens and bring back interesting stuff for the emperor to look at. Most famously, he makes it all the way to East Africa and brings the emperor back a giraffe. Um, Another purpose is to establish diplomatic relationships with local uh, rulers around the Indian Ocean Basin, extend China's political influence, and uh, bring them into China's tribute system, um, which you might remember from uh, when we talked about the Song Dynasty. Um, but that's that kind of act of political submission, which is uh, the ticket for entry into trade with China, which is, of course, a really big deal if you want luxury goods in the 15th century. And so in the course of those seven voyages, I'll show you a map in a minute. Zheng He establishes China's prowess uh, technologically, economically, politically, and also vastly expands uh, political reach of China. And of course, lays the foundation for um, a lot of private people who don't work for the state, for a lot of private Chinese merchants to do business in that area as well. So China's really dominant in the Indian Ocean basin, in the Indian Ocean trade network in this period. And then in 1433, the Yongle Emperor has died and his successors just pull the plug completely on Zheng He. And they actually just let the treasure fleet decay in port. It doesn't sail again. Um, the government, there's a variety of reasons for this, um, some of which are sort of short-sightedness, some of which are there's all these invasions happening from the north and they feel the need to concentrate on that. Um, and some of which are actually that, you know, China doesn't really need to actively uh, promote trade. They don't actively, they don't really need to send ships out because their goods are so attractive in the, in the worldwide commercial market that everybody's going to come to China anyway. They have everything they already need um, and they don't have a huge need to seek it out in other countries. But the moral of the story is um, that 
A, it's super impressive that any political system in this period could produce a set of state-sponsored voyages that establish that not only travel to all these places marked on the map, but also that establish such significant political influence in all those places marked on the map. And B, China just kind of gives it up summarily. Um, and why China, the, the significance of that decision is what we're going to return to on Monday and put it in contrast um, with the, the parallel situation, the same time period in Europe. That's all. Thanks very much.